we're going to do some abstract art and cutting some shapes out of this piece here I made a while ago. I already cut out some shapes over here. Afterwards, of which I'm going to glue them onto the canvas and begin working on this piece. All the while, we'll be listening to music and a lecture from the book How Conversation Works Six Lessons for Better Communications. And we're on lecture two. How the conversational floor works. Lecture two. How the conversational floor works. An expression like shooting the breeze, which dates back to World War II, can make casual conversation sound entirely free flowing, like words are being tossed about in the flow of a gentle wind. But in fact, even the most breezy conversation, in that conversation there's an underlying systematic structure, and we follow some strikingly predictable routines. These routines can suddenly become apparent when we encounter a different routine in another language or culture. Here are a couple of my favorite examples. In Chinese, the way to say hello is ni hao, which means, how are you? That may seem familiar enough, but the answer may not. The answer in Chinese to ni hao is ni hao. So when I was teaching English in China in the early 1990s, students would often respond to me when I would say, how are you? They would say, how are you? And I would say, no, no. In English, you actually say, fine, which is equally meaningless as saying, how are you, in response to how are you, but that's just what we do in English. Another way to greet someone in Chinese is that. to ask, Chirma, or Chirma Mayo, which means, have you eaten yet? Now, this question should not be seen as an invitation to lunch. In fact, it's just a warm greeting, showing concern for your well-being. In this lecture, we'll work our way through a conversation from beginning to end as we navigate the conversational floor with others. Some of the information about the conversational floor may seem fairly obvious as soon as I say it. You'll think, oh my goodness, of course that's what we do. But some of what I will tell you will surprise you. Starting a conversation is probably the most ritualized part of the whole thing. In the U.S., possible greetings include, Hi, hey, hello, good morning, yo. Then there's sometimes a greeting question. How are you? What's up? Or the shortened version, what's up? There are very nice answers to those questions. How are you? The answer is, fine, okay, good. What's up? Nothing, not much. We have all experienced the disconcerting moment when someone takes a routine greeting question as a real question and suddenly is telling you how they really are. And you're thinking, no, no, I don't have time for this. I need to talk with you about something else. And often, if we really do want to know how someone is, we ask again. We'll say something like, so everything's really going okay? Cancer healthy again? It is possible to start a conversation without a ritual greeting, but it's unusual. It's also potentially unsettling for the person you're talking to, and in some parts of the world, it is considered highly impolite. Imagine, I walk up to you in the hall and say, I need to ask you about the memo I received from Marcus this morning. It makes the conversation feel abrupt and very directed or very intimate, as if we just talked five minutes ago and I'm continuing that conversation. There's also perhaps an assertion of power here. I am assuming that you are available to talk to me whenever I want to talk to you. No greeting necessary. It's more likely that I'll start with, hi. Hi, do you have a minute? I need to ask you about the memo I received from Marcus this morning. That greeting acknowledges the other person and sets up a different, much more collegial tone. 
And I would advise all of you who work in an office where there are staff whose job it is to help you to think about this. But I think too often people walk up to staff members and say, I need you to do this for me without a greeting, without an acknowledgement of that person, without setting this up as a conversation. Now all of that assumed you were opening a conversation with people you knew. So you didn't have to introduce yourself in addition to saying hi. There's a more challenging situation. How do you open the floor and start a conversation with people you don't know? Here's a scenario that many of you have probably lived through. I certainly know I have. There you are, brought to a party or a wedding by a friend or a spouse or someone else, and you're confronting a room of people you don't know. Your friend or spouse has disappeared, and there you are. You get a drink to kill some time, but now there's nothing to do other than try and find someone to talk to. Remember that many people find this difficult. It's not just you. It can help to see it as a challenge to yourself, to meet someone new and learn something. So you walk up to these people who are in a conversation, and then what do you do? Let's look at Jessica try and do this. If I make an offer or an invitation, 
I'm giving the floor to you to accept or reject that invitation. Sometimes, as a way of giving over the floor, we'll trail off. It's not that we become completely silent, but we trail off with these little words like, you know, I mean, so. And that's a way to say that we're done and somebody else can come in. Hand movements can be a signal. If we're someone who talks with our hands, as I do, sometimes we can signal that we're finishing by quieting down our hands or by gesturing toward the other person to give them the floor. Eye contact also sends signals. We often make direct eye contact as a way of giving someone the floor with their eyes. When we're talking with someone, often our eyes split a little bit. We're not doing as much direct eye contact, but then we will look directly at the person to turn over the floor. Now this is all very neat and orderly, and sometimes conversation is that way. But a lot of the time, we talk on top of each other. We don't wait for someone to hand us the floor before we start talking. This is where the dancing analogy breaks down a bit, because it isn't all neatly choreographed. We do the equivalent of stepping on each other's feet a lot. But it often doesn't feel like we're stepping on each other's feet. It feels very natural and not at all painful. Linguists call this simultaneous talk. And if you record a spontaneous conversation, you'll find a lot of it. This script does not look at all like talk on TV. I sometimes send students out with recorders, and they come back in disbelief of how many people can talk on top of each other at one time, three or four or more. Now, some of this simultaneous talk can be very cooperative. I step in at a moment when I think you're finished, or near the end of your turn, I'm providing some affirmation. Let's look at an example of a conversation between two men that has quite friendly and simultaneous talk. I just wanted to be home. I was trapped. Marty was already dead. My God, that place feels like the third world on a hot day. It's comfortable. And there were these two women that were literally yelling at each other. Oh, wait, really? Yeah. And the guy at the desk is already at the call, asking everyone to remain calm. And then I hear them ask if there's a dog room. Here we see that David, while he is talking simultaneously, is providing positive feedback. And at another point, he's asking a question to further the story. This simultaneous talk doesn't feel like David is trying to grab the floor. But sometimes, simultaneous talk clearly feels like an interruption. It feels like a grab for the floor. Let's look at a different version of the conversation between these two men. Just like I was trapped on the party in here. So did you um, get the memo I sent you last night? I did. My laptop was out of juice at the airport. All the albums were occupied. And there were these ladies. You know what? I once paid a kid 10 bucks to plug his iPod so I could recharge my laptop. That was LAX. Ten bucks is pretty cheap. Here, David jumps in when Charles is clearly not finished, but David seems to be finished. And David changes the topic. Charles then starts a story, but David steps in to tell his own. This simultaneous talk does not feel very cooperative. I do want to note here that some aspects of simultaneous talk are cultural. In my family, we see a lot of this simultaneous talk as highly cooperative overlap. We seem to think that if you know what somebody's going to say, then you might as well help them finish their sentence so that you can then continue on. But of course, not everyone sees this as fully cooperative behavior, and different parts of the country have different rhythms for conversation and different levels of tolerance for silence. So my advice is to watch yourself and make sure you're not cutting people off without meaning to. And if you catch yourself cutting someone off, apologize and try and give back the floor. You can say, oh, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Keep going. And if you are a simultaneous talker like me, step back sometimes if you can feel that you're doing this in a conversation and ask yourself, is 
Is there a rush for you to speak? Or can you let this person finish? There's another kind of simultaneous talk that we barely notice. And that's those little listening noises that we make. These noises like, uh huh, yeah, mm, wow, huh. We also nod as part of this. Linguists call this kind of behavior back channeling. And it's very, very helpful for other speakers. Back channeling shows that we're listening, we're following along, we're engaged. And this is something that we almost all do on the phone. This is going to make you very self-conscious on the phone. When you hear yourself, you're going to hear yourself going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Because if you don't, fairly quickly somebody's going to stop and ask if you're still there. Now, I want to add a cautionary note here with back channeling. If you are disagreeing with a speaker, someone's talking to you and you realize you don't agree, you may want to adjust your back channeling. You want your back channeling to signal that you're following, but not necessarily that you're agreeing. So you may want to use back channels more like, hmm, hmm, as opposed to, yeah, because that will throw a speaker if you're going, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, and then suddenly at the end, you disagree. There is a power play sometimes in not back channeling, and it's helpful to realize that you can use not back channeling to express skepticism or lack of engagement. So it's something you want to use cautiously because it really can throw people if they're talking with you and you're not sending any signals of engagement, but there are moments where that may be something you want to do. It's also worth remembering when you're an audience member, back channeling can really make a difference for a speaker, especially in a smaller audience. If you're out there giving a talk and talking to an audience, it's really nice to have people nodding to give you a sense that people are engaged with what you're saying. Then I want to talk briefly about the issue of what I call talk time. I think all of us know people who don't seem to have a very good sense of talk time. That is, they seem to talk more than their fair share without ever really trying to turn the floor over. Are you suddenly worried that this might be you? Here are a few ways no. for you to try to figure it out. If you're talking and no one is back channeling, you should ask yourself what is happening. Have you overstayed your welcome on the conversational floor? If you find yourself near the end of a conversation saying, I've been talking this whole time, how are you? Then it's worth monitoring your talk time a bit. Or, if you finish a conversation and realize that you know very little about what the other person thinks or what is going on with them, it's worth thinking about how much of the talking you did or how good your questions were. Remember that study showing the correlation between happiness and substantive conversation? And a substantive conversation ideally means hearing from both people. So we signal to people that we're engaged with back channeling. We also signal, as I mentioned earlier, when we're going to give a dispreferred response. In adjacency pairs like questions and answers, or an invitation and an acceptance or rejection, there's often a preferred response, something like yes, or accepting an invitation. So let's think of an example. You ask me, can you send that email to Jasmine? And I say, um, well, I'm preparing you for you. Or at least I'm preparing you for my attempt to get out of doing what you have to do. I know. 
which is different from sitting there in silence as you think about the answer to the question. But young people also often use fillers a lot, especially like, and it may be a way for them to negotiate their position as not yet adults, because it can make them sound less confident, and sometimes conversationally they are less confident. That said, some well-known orders use um strategically sometimes in a thoughtful pause. But like is not entirely like um. You may be judged for using filler like, and that is worth remembering in professional environments. There's a study by Jennifer Daly O'Kane at the University of Alberta, and what she found was that like is not necessarily used more by women. Many people think that it is. It also found that men and women who use like are judged as less intelligent, but highly likable. If you're now wondering whether you use discourse markers too much, try taping yourself in a professional context or in a personal context, but do ask permission from people before you tape them. You can also just ask someone who loves you. They will know if you have a discourse marker that you use a lot. Again, part of becoming an ever more effective speaker is becoming more aware of how you speak. Now, note the discourse marker. Now, as if you weren't self-conscious enough at this point, I'm going to tell you about what talking about the weather can do. I think we all get the sense that it can be a place to start a conversation. It's shared ground, maybe shared commiseration or happiness. It's a way to warm up a conversation. What you may not realize is that we use talking about the weather sometimes to wrap up a conversation. We've talked about stuff, we're nearing the end, and someone will say, can you believe this weather we're having? As a way to say, time to wrap this up. And there's a great story here. I was reading the work, an article about this, and I then went in to have a meeting with the chair of my department. And we have our meeting, and at the end of the meeting he says, as we're wrapping up, he says, I hear it's going to be almost 50 today. And I snort, which is a completely inappropriate response to the chair of your department talking about the weather. But it was so characteristic of what talking about the weather can do. In concluding this lecture, let's turn to closing a conversation, which is trickier than we sometimes realize. When you think about it, what we're trying to do is negotiate our way to silence. One way to think about it is how a famous article puts it. We are trying to address the closing problem, which is how can we get to the point where my saying something does not elicit a response from you. In other words, the turn-taking stops. And somehow you know and I know that this is not just a momentary silence. It turns out to be a fairly drawn out process as we try and make sure that everyone has said what they're gonna say, what they need to say, and is ready to close. So we give people multiple turns to make sure they're finished. Let's look at a closing to a spoken conversation. Okay, so I'll call you on Saturday. That sounds great. Excellent. Uh, good luck with the interview. Thanks, I'll let you know. Good. Okay. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. Look at all those turns where almost nothing was said. We got a lot of, um, well, so, okay, bye. Interestingly, it appears that we take about as many turns to close when we're IMing or G-chatting to close things down. Let me share with you a written exchange. This comes from Naomi Barron's book, Always On, in which two women are closing down a conversation. Gail. Hey, I gotta run. Sally. Okay. Sally again. I'll TTYL. Gail. Gotta do errands. Gail again. Yep. Sally. Okay. Sally. Smiley face. Even when we're online, it can take multiple turns to make sure everybody's ready to end the conversation. So now I'll bring this lecture to a close, bring myself to silence, so that you can go watch and listen to people maneuvering the conversation forward. In the next lecture, we'll turn to a different set of strategies. Specifically, we'll look at how we use conversations to get things done.
Ooh, it's a messy. Really messy. Have a great day.